Chapter 16, Part 1, The Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance is something that you can study in multiple semesters. There's so much happening at this time. But, you know, we have to pare it down a little bit for this book. So, the early Renaissance is characterized by Donatello, Ghiberti, Masaccio, and Botticelli. Donatello is a sculptor and used the body as a framework on which the fabric drape as opposed to kind of just drawing or sculpting fabric. So create, sculptors create full-scale clay models of nude figures um, and then drape clay-soaked linen over the, over the clay models and create the garments because they want it to look realistic and somebody's not going to stand there for that long of a period of time for carving. So that's a technique that uh, sculptors would use. So this Donatello of St. Mark is so different than if we looked at um, the sculptures at a Gothic cathedral. Uh, he's in proportion. You know, his head and body look like a real human. He's got our contrapposto stance. We came back to this because we're in the Renaissance. The Renaissance is the rebirth of classical uh, Greek and Roman ideology and um, also art forms. So many things actually when you think about it, math and so on. But the idea of human knowledge. We're coming out of um, the Middle Ages, we're coming out of medieval Europe and we're starting to pursue enlightened thought and we're starting to pursue um, ideas about humanity and the focus is, is less about God and religion and more about um, living here on earth. Um, of course, this is St. Mark. He is still a saint, but he looks far more human than his medieval predecessors. Uh, the drapery, as we're talking about that soaked cloth, so we wanted the drapery to look realistic so it would kind of hang off him with some gravity. But just look at the hand and the detail and the veins and so on. It's a realistic hand. Uh, just a gorgeous uh, sculpture here. And he uh, influences a lot of sculptors moving forward, including Michelangelo. Okay, so Ghiberti, he designs these Baptist, uh, baptistry doors for the Florence Cathedral. And um, he uses the figures on the same, sale, same scale in his work. Sorry. Uh, architecture and figures in the same scale. Masaccio is a painter, and he gets into linear perspective to create deep, convincing architectural space within painting in two-dimensional work. So it's a it's a three-dimensional, sorry, it's a two-dimensional work, and it looks three-dimensional, and we'll get into that. So here's Ghiberti's, um, a close-up of, of part of the doors. So this is just one segment of these large bronze doors. Um, or their gilt bronze bronze overlay on top of um, perhaps iron. I'm not sure. Okay, so the story of Jacob and Esau, he's starting to use this one-point perspective. And one of the clues with the one-point perspective is when they use a tile floor, it's almost like a grid design to sort of figure out where things are. And we're looking straight down the middle here, focal point somewhere over there, toward his finger probably more realistically and all these angles if you follow the edges which is kind of hard to do it's a little bit easier over here because you can see this corner but if you followed that line down this would if you put a ruler you're going to end up somewhere over here and notice he's pointing there too he's trying to get your focal uh your eyes to go toward the back here toward this one point perspective so we see a straight line there and we know everything's kind of converging into that direction by these tile floors and then also the lines from the architectural elements here they all follow this one line going down there one point perspective meaning this is that one point that we focus on the horizon would be somewhere in here um, and that's where we'd be looking so we're out here standing out here the dogs are almost um, completely three-dimensional. They're further away from this flat uh, panel here from the from the low relief we see in the back. Then we get into some high relief, and then the figures almost come completely free. Um, so this this is really playing with our perception of depths and of space, and um, 
that's where we get into with the Renaissance. We start to use one point perspective and here we are out in the out, outside world. So a beautiful depiction of the story of Jacob and Esau, uh, Gilberte on some bronze doors for a church. Masaccio uh, is using some architectural elements. This is a real um, coffered ceiling from a real um, uh, place, a real building. And then our one point perspective brings us a little bit lower. I think it's lower here and we have our hand pointing to it as well. So Christ is here. We have a little bit of hierarchical scale going on where, you know, of course, God is up here. Christ is here. So we know because he's higher up that um, he's more important. And then we have almost a register here, not quite. But these two figures aren't really quite in here with the saints and with Christ. They're a little bit outside. So these would be the donors of um, toward the art, uh, sorry, toward the art and toward the church. There would be donors and they want to make their way to heaven by donating money. So they're outside. They're not within the Holy Trinity here but they are um, in the area close to them, okay? But look at the architectural detail, very realistic. Um, Corinthian columns there, um, coffered ceiling. So then we're going to move forward into Botticelli, and he worked for the Medici family, and the Medicis were super important in the time of the Renaissance, and you can watch like a two-hour YouTube on them. I think it was done by PBS. I'm not sure. It looks a little dated. But anyway, um, they are wealthy merchant class. So we're moving away from um, the people with power and money are the rulers and the emperors and that kind of thing, the kings, and the pope or the church or the religious figures. Now we have this third group, um, the merchant class, because trade is really happening Think about, you know, this is getting into the 1400s. This is a little bit before Columbus, but trade is starting to happen a little bit closer to home. Money's changing hands. Good or, goods are starting to be made in larger quantities. Uh, so the cities are thriving and that kind of thing. So there, these merchant class have money to spend on art. So they become patrons. Patrons is a really good word to know. So they patronize or spend money on um, uh, uh, art groups, and in this case, the academy begins here. So the art academy, colleges today, the co you know, like a college art class that you're attending at this moment while you're watching this, this is an extension of this Renaissance academy. The idea that there are certain standards and, and structure and so on. And there's times where the academy falls out of favor, and there's times uh, where it's important um, and this is one of those where it's getting uh, developed here. So the shift is also toward humanism. So they're discussing classical culture and its relationship to Christianity. Um, for this whole time through the Middle Ages, the whole idea was to get away from classicism, to get away from Greek and Roman belief systems or anything to do um, with that time period because you want to focus on um, Christ and you want to focus on religion and nothing to do with study and um, thoughtful. People were highly illiterate in the Middle Ages and now we're coming back to education again. So these two combined systems are thought to uh, be called now Neoplatonism. So you're taking in the ideas from Plato from classical Greece and Greek and Rome. Plato is a, is a um, from that time period, he's, you know, at this point, 1400 years back, and is combining it with Christianity. So then we get the birth of Venus. So Venus, as we know, Venus or Aphrodite, she, in her myth Greek mythology, is born on a sea in the sea foam, and um, Poseidon, um, she's the daughter of Poseidon, and she comes from the sea. So we see a combination of, of things. She is depicted a lot like how um, Eve would be depicted in previous artworks. And, of course, she's nude, which is kind of a shocker here. Uh, even at the time period, the Catholic Church was not so big on this. Um, because Eve was the only one who was portrayed nude. Because that, for the Catholic Church and for the Church in general, that was the only woman that was depicted nude because it was before the fall of man. So... 
couple objections here. She's she's nude and she should be Eve if she's going to be nude. And the other one is that she is a pagan deity, meaning Greco-Roman mythology. So we have Zephyrs over here blowing the wind. Um, and then this figure, we're not exactly sure who she's supposed to be, but she's going to clothe Venus as she comes to shore. Now we don't have perfect one point uh, perspective here. It's a little trickier when you don't have architectural details. This is a little bit flatter, so you could say it's kind of a transitional piece to a degree, although it's smack in the middle of the Renaissance in 1480. Uh, our Renaissance time frame is 1400 to 1600 roughly. But um, it's not a pure Renaissance uh, piece. She's not hyper-realistic. Uh, she's a little bit soft and flattened. So the High Renaissance, so we were just out in, in the early Renaissance, the High Renaissance lasted for about 20 five years ending around 1520 and da Vinci and Michelangelo are the big names here but there's also Raphael, Titian, and Giorgione and um, the idea of the Renaissance man previously you wouldn't separate out a course of study da Vinci and Michelangelo are multi-talented multi-genius people kind of amazing they were alive at the same time um, and, and it's just, it's just kind of mind boggling when you think about it. But anyway, da, Vin da Vinci more so in terms of so many different things that he was interested in. He was an engineer, a scientist, a musician, a painter, an inventor, and a sculptor. So he left a lot of works incomplete, incompleted, and no wonder. He's a busy guy. Maybe he had ADHD, maybe that's what we call it now. <laughs> but he had many things that he was involved with and many things he accomplished. Okay, so the Mona Lisa Last Supper are his two most famous works. These are both paintings. Uh, Mona Lisa is an oil paint and the Last Supper is a fresco. His technique called sfumato, that's what he gets known for, have to do with glazes that you can now do with oil paints. So basically it's the oil with not much pigment in it, just a smidgen to sort of make a hazy atmosphere to soften everything. Um, let's look at her for a moment. So he he might have done some underpainting as well, which would have been maybe a darker color here to darken this. But all this softness, I mean, there is there is age in this painting and, and perhaps um, somewhere in terror, we kind of see this texturized sort of crackling. But the idea of the softness in the back, that atmospheric perspective, and the softness of her skin and sort of the roundness, um, there's no crisp lines in here in the way that you see in like the Northern Renaissance where everything is super, um, oh, just very knife edge looking uh, edges to everything. Everything is soft. The clothing is soft. Beautiful details, beautifully executed. Um, a lot of craftsmanship here and talent, of course, but he liked this soft, smoky look. So that's what a lot of this brownish, uh, kind of orangey-brown coloration is. Those are glazes with a smidgen of pigment, and he might do multiple layers of these. We see this when we move forward to Rembrandt is fond of glazes as well. So um, when we look studying the human proportions, he's going back to thinking about the Greeks and the Romans here. And he's starting to think about how um, the world works again, like in that in that philosophy and thought of proportion. So he started to do drawings. The other interesting thing with this is this is mirror writing. I mean, the man is just so compli complicated. So this was meant to be read in the mirror. It was all sort of backward and I think upside down. Is, uh, I think it's just backward. So it was just backward. So he starts the sentence here and he writes it backward. And then you can put it in the mirror. So, I mean, the guy was just a phenomenal human being. Um, there are very few. Einstein would be up there with one of those geniuses. But Einstein was a little more focused towards science, of course. Another piece, Madonna and Child with Saint. Now, this was restored. So, we are missing, perhaps, some of our sfumato. Look how blue that blue is. And the flesh tones. I mean, if we compare them... You know, we're not entirely sure. This may have faded over time a little bit. And this may be what he truly wanted us to see. But there were some 
controversies when things started to get restored because we don't know if those glazes, what they originally looked like. We have no way to know. There's no photography. There's no documentation. There's no notes about this. So some people think these are garish and bright now. Um, this is oil on wood and Mona Lisa's oil on panel. I want to clarify that because canvas has not come into general use at this point. So panel also means wood. Um, so these two are oil on wood. Uh, d the Last Supper, this is important to know. You know what I just learned? I, I don't know why I never knew this, but this is actually Passover. So, you know, Jesus is a Jewish gentleman and he is having Passover with his apostles. And then after this point in time, you know, of course, we have Christianity or it's starting to take a hold, but he's at Passover. Okay, we have one point perspective coming down here toward Jesus' head. Um, going out the window, and then we have atmospheric perspective in that it's faded out there, more details in the foreground, okay? So we do see the mountains, we do see the distance with atmospheric perspective. We have all these architectural lines to tell us where to look. Notice these lines coming down here, and the coffered ceiling, which works much like the tiled floor. Um, this particular piece was not... Um, a standard fresco painting technique. Um, da Vinci, much, you know, some, he experimented a lot. And sometimes that was a really great thing and he came across some things that would work really well. Other times he took a risk and it didn't work. So unfortunately, this paint did not stick on the wall. This has been repaired and restored many times and we've lost a lot of detail. You can kind of see how the blues over here are kind of faded and sort of chipped. But this thing is always in a state of falling apart. But with a fresco, since it's attached to the wall, there's really not much you can do. Um, the paint is soaked into the wall. Um, you can fix it a little bit, but there's been many restorations. Part of the problem, too, is climate and dampness, and the water is leaching into the wall itself. So Michelangelo is 25 years younger than Leonardo, but it's his greatest rival. Now, these two gentlemen probably would never have reached the heights they had without each other because that little bit of competition or a lot of competition, we don't know exactly, um, really probably spurred them on to, to attain greater and greater heights. So Michelangelo is a sculptor before everything else. He finds all this other stuff, especially painting, um, a lesser art form. I agree with him. Um, but <laughs> we'd be in the minority for sure. Uh, but he gets asked to do the Sistine Chapel. He doesn't want to do it, but what is he going to say? He can't say no to the Pope. And also, he is the architect of the new St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. Either one of these two works, if you only ever did one of these things, including David, sculpture, painting, architect, uh, architecture, any one of those three, Oh my gosh, you know, you'd be down in the history books for the rest of your days. But all three is pretty phenomenal. And this guy does finish things. So Michelangelo's David here. We can see the influence. I'm going to back up to our friend Donatello. We can see the influence of the musculature. This has got drapery on it, of course. But we can see um, the influence on the detail and musculature from Donatello. You can also see, if you put this next to a Greek statue, which I don't have that PowerPoint pulled up right now, but if you put it next to that, you can really see a lot of similarities. Michelangelo goes a little further. He gets into much more detail of the body. He's really studying the hands, all kinds of detail. He's got the contrapposto. He's bringing that back as well. Um, and the hair He's, he's trying to find a good way to sculpt hair. It's very difficult. This is one block of stone. Isn't that incredible? And then he needs a little support for this ankle. Putting a, a this heavy amount of stone on these tiny skinny uh, supports at the ankle is very dangerous. So he put a little tree branch here. But the, you know, the Greeks and Romans do this as well. Absolutely gorgeous form. Sistine Chapel... What can you say? It's just an astounding experience and masterpiece, and uh, each individual panel is incredible. 
um, back up here again. This was painted at one point, and then he came back and did this last judgment. Somebody else, I believe, did these sides, but this is quite dark. At the end of his life, he does this. It's very dark. Different. The style shifts quite a bit, but on the disturbing side. But he does this whole ceiling. Now, some of this is actual architecture, but most of it is not. It's painted in, and we're going to look at this up close here. So there's actual architectural details here. Do you see this? Okay, I'm going to go back here. These are actual stone segments of the building. This stuff is not. So that is the detail at which he is he's able to paint. This is all painted and, and faux marble. It's not real. He paints in all these little statues and he paints all this stuff. It's called trompe l'oeil, fool the eye. So we're fooling the eye here, or he's fooling our eye, um, because he wants to break this up into segments. Because the Bible, you know, trying to get the entire thing up there on the ceiling, that's overwhelming. So he's trying to get it into certain segments. And of course, this is God um, with uh, the creation of Adam here in the center. So that's the beginning, first story. So he's, he's giving us little panels in which to look at certain stories. And then there are little puti, these little figures here, and different uh, figures uh, around. Uh, we can't see any of the sibyls really here, but there's a, m a multitude of figures that, that sort of sit around in little different areas, um, sort of accenting things, but the main stories are within the panels.